I was nothing to do with him going. The most awful thing had happened before he went. I was in his study talking to him about his trip. The telephone rang, it was coming off. So I thought, should I be nice or should I just sit here? So I thought I'd be nice, so I left him to it and just broke my heart for him. Diana's anxiety began to show in a more troubling way. In five months, she lost five and a half inches from her waist, and not just to look good in her wedding dress. Bulimia started the week after we got engaged. My husband put his hand on my waistline and said, Oh, a bit chubby here, aren't we? And that triggered off something in me. And I remember the first time I made myself sick, I was so thrilled, because I thought, right, this is the release of tension. The disease would plague her for years. She had an episode of bulimia the night before her wedding. After she found a bracelet, Charles was giving Camilla. There is bunting going up all over London, and there are pictures of the royal couple in just about every shop window in town. I mean, the Camilla thing, so I was desperate, desperate. Some people are already staking out seats along... I ate everything I could possibly find. I was sick as a parrot that night, and it was such an indication of what was going on. Any woman in Diana's position might have called the whole thing off. But there were more than two people in this relationship. There were millions. She saw no way out. Her sisters tried to raise her spirits. I said, I can't marry. I can't do this. This is absolutely unbelievable. And they were wonderful. They said, well, bad luck, Dutch. Your face is on the tea towel, so you're too late to chicken out. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, heir to the throne of England. And here comes the bride. On the morning of July 29th, 1981, with trumpets blaring and a worldwide audience of more than 700 million savoring every detail, Diana emerged from her glass carriage, feeling like she was going to an execution. I was very, very deathly calm, deathly, deathly calm. I felt as though I was a, a lamb to the slaughter. And I knew it when I couldn't tell about it. It was all pomp and spectacle. I thought the whole thing was hysterical, but you know, in the sense that it was just like, um, it was so grown up. And here was Diana, a kindergarten teacher, I and mean, the whole thing was ridiculous. There were 2,500 guests in the cathedral that morning. Diana was keenly aware of one. As I walked up the aisle, um, I was looking for her. Spotted Camilla, pale grey, pillar box hat, saw it all to this day, you know, vivid memory. And I thought, well, there we are, that's, that's it, let's hope that's all over with. Desperate for a happy ending, Diana decided to focus on the positive. She was very much in love with Charles. Maybe now, she thought, he'd be in love with her, too. I couldn't take my eyes off him. I just absolutely... I thought I was the luckiest girl in the world, and you know, he was going to look after me. Well, was I wrong on that assumption? After their wedding, the royal couple set out for Buckingham Palace. One million people, by some estimates, turned out to show their excitement for Diana. The new princess was awestruck. Got out on the balcony, overwhelming what we saw. So humble, making all these thousands and thousands of people happy. It was just wonderful. Former palace spokesman Dickie Arbiter remembered the single moment the crowd had been waiting for. It was almost a chant from the crowd: "Kiss her, kiss her." And they did kiss on the balcony. They'd never been done before, but they did. And there was a tremendous roar from the crowd. But even in those first hours, those who knew Diana best were already worried about her future. It was an optimistic time, but I can also remember a sense of just wondering, I can also remember a sense of just wondering how she'd manage in the system, and, uh, and I think that was a shared feeling by many of us. Their wedding night was to be their first intimate night together. Diana said only that it was strange, very strange. They spent part of their honeymoon on the royal yacht, Britannia. But romance hardly filled the air. For their private diversion, Charles brought the works of a South African philosopher. I just had tremendous hope in me, which was slashed by day two. <laughs> 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 
my husband took um, eight Lawrence Van Der novels along on our honeymoon. Well, no, to read. So every lunchtime or dinner time, when we were allowed to be on our own, we were supposed to read them, but we were never on our own. And I remember crying my heart out on my honeymoon. I was so tired. For all the wrong reasons. <laughs> totally. Her husband's choice of reading material was the least of her worries. We were opening our diaries to discuss various things. Out comes two pictures of Camilla. And on our honeymoon, we have a white tie dinner for President Sadat. Cufflinks arrive on his wrist. Two C's entwined, like the Chanel C. Oh, uh, right. Got it in one. Knew exactly. So I said, Camilla gave you those, didn't he? He said, yes. So what's wrong? They're present from a friend. And boy, did we have a row. Jealousy. Total. Jealousy. Even on her honeymoon, the new princess could not escape Camilla's shadow. In my dreams were appalling at night. I dreamt of Camilla the whole time. And the bulimia was appalling, absolutely appalling. It was rife. It was four times a day on the yacht. Anything I could find, I would gobble up and be sick two minutes later. Very tired. For one minute, one would be happy. The next minute, one would be blubbing one's eyes out. How are you enjoying my life? Highly recommend. Diana kept her troubles hidden from the public. Her admirers clung to the image of the kindergarten teacher plucked from obscurity by a handsome prince, who took her off to a castle to live happily ever after. But Diana struggled to find her footing. So that first week was such a traumatic week for me. I learned to be royal in one week. I was thrown into the deep end. Nobody ever helped me at all. They'd be there to criticize, but never be there to say, well done. Diana fell back on what she knew best to be herself. She had the common touch that could bridge the gap between the palace and the people. The public responded to her. It would be a long time before Diana understood why. People say to me, thank you for bringing happiness into my life. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making the effort. Thank you for being you. All those things I never used to believe. Engaging the public is one thing. Coping with the media, quite another. They demanded more and more. Ken Lennox made a career out of photographing Diana. Everything she did, every time she breathed in or out, they took a photograph. The whole world were focusing on me every day. I was in the front of the papers, and I thought this was just so appalling. I hadn't actually done anything specific like climb Everest or done something wonderful like that. In November of 1981, the palace announced that the princess was pregnant. Diana's struggle with her health proved doubly difficult. Sick the whole time, bulimia and morning sickness. People tried to put me on pills to stop me being sick. I refused to take the responsibility that if the child appeared handicapped, I wasn't going to take responsibility. To make matters worse, the news that she was expecting only drove the press corps into a greater frenzy. Photographers were determined to get a picture of the pregnant Diana. Nothing seemed off limits. Lennox and his tabloid competitors followed Diana and Charles on their vacation to a very private island in the Bahamas. Using a very long lens, Lennox snapped pictures of a pregnant princess in a bikini. She was distraught. I was horrified, because I'd never walk around looking like that in a bikini. The Queen called it the blackest day in the history of British journalism. Overstepped the line, yeah. Oh, totally overstepped the line. By the standards of that time. 